We'll just give it about one more minute before we get started. I'm going to get started. We normally have more people roll in kind of in the first five minutes or so. So um, I will introduce our presenter. So welcome to the CCA workshop in cultural affairs series. This is our, I believe, our fourth, wor fourth workshop. And today we have um, Jacob Brownstein. He's a PhD candidate in economics at UC Berkeley. And he studies public finance and labor econ. And we are very lucky to have him today because he's studying a topic of great interest to a lot of people who attend this workshop, who are part of the Center for Cultural Affairs, um, public investment in the arts and cultural agglomeration, evidence from the New Deal. So um, with that, I'll stop talking and, and, and hand it over to Jacob. And Jacob, I will monitor the chat. And if anyone has a question, please feel free to put it in, into the chat. Um, or unmute yourself and ask if it's an appropriate time. If not, I assume we'll just hold questions for the end, but we definitely have sort of um, conversations ongoing in the chat, usually while presenters are presenting. And I will make sure to summarize at the end for you, Jacob, if you don't follow that, okay? So thanks Excellent. So yeah, thank you. Uh, everybody can hear me and see um, changing slides. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and I'm really, really happy to share this work uh, with you all. So I'm going to be studying public investment in the arts and how uh, artistic professions agglomerate in response to such funding. I'm going to be looking at the New Deal in my setting. So let me start by asking a few central questions. Um, a lot of people are interested in, in the question of what is the impact of arts funding and particularly can central planners use arts funding to influence the share of artists over time? Uh, and another way of understanding that, that question, or rather the answer to that question of whether we can understand the current location of uh, the locations of the current culture of current cultural hotspots, I guess cultural hotspots as defined by localities with higher uh, shares of artists per capita. How can we understand these locations based on historical local funding to the arts? Um, a similar related question is to what extent is artistic activity path dependent in nature? Um, lastly, I'm gonna be asking how does this, how do the impacts of arts funding vary by field? And in my setting, I'm gonna be uh, conducting a causal program evaluation from New Deal arts spending. Just to make this very clear, uh, just as a stylized example, I here I've plotted authors per capita in San Francisco and Cleveland. The y-axis is percent, so like 0.1 is one in 1,000, not, <laughs> not um, 100 in 1,000. San Francisco is a city that received substantial writers program funding during the New Deal, and Cleveland received much less funding. And just to make this very, just as this example, uh, the question is, did San Francisco, uh, See, see an increase, see an elevated um, uh, number of authors per capita in response to this funding, leading to more sustained growth. Um, I think this example makes uh, makes the question a lot more concrete. So, looking at the arts from a quantitative perspective, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of caveats, or I don't have to go into all of the all of the difficulties associated with studying the arts from a quantitative perspective. But in terms of arts funding. Uh, Funding, funding the arts from a central planner's perspective is controversial. Most evidence is uh, is correlative, and the correlative and and the causal estimates, um, uh, the proponents of arts funding, the pr proponents of arts funding, um, uh, cite evidence that claim positive impacts of arts funding on individual behavior, on individual well being. Um, there are more urban works uh, concerned with productivity and sorting processes that discuss how uh, amenities have positive spin spittle, uh, amount, amenities have positive spillovers into the surrounding environments. Uh, this urban this work on urban uh, urban economics also talks about uh, endogenous sorting processes between um, 
between workers and localities, as well as amenity accumulation, which ties in very closely to the question of arts funding. For example, whether uh, whether funding arts, whether funding artistic amenities can influence the accumulation of these amenities in the law in the long run, they can also influence these urban sorting processes. Um, but among these challenges, oh, <laughs> it gets, oh, I didn't think about this. This room gets, oh no, this room gets dark every like couple seconds. I have to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, not really much is known about the about arts funding from a causal uh, from a causal perspective. There aren't so many instances of uh, of sufficiently salient uh, uh, salient funding programs. These funding programs, the 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 programs that do exist, aren't really quasi experimental, which lend to uh, which lend to the um, which lend to really producing cor uh, correlative evidence, which is which is useful. But uh, perhaps less use, but perhaps less useful per, for uh, for policymakers that are in, that are interested in understanding what is the causal impact of uh, of uh, this funding. So this is what brings me to the New Deal arts programs. So a brief note on the program that I'm studying here. Um, I study federal project number one. This is the first instance of substantial federal funding to the arts. Um, it allocated about two billion U.S. dollars in present day funding uh, across four different projects in U.S. cities. One is the Federal Arts Project for visual artists, the Music Project for musicians, actors uh, for the theater program, and writers for the writing program. Uh, one important note is that, in some respect, you may took you may look at two billion dollars, and when uh, it's interesting, some people have priors that that think of this as a very large amount. Some people think of it as very small. But importantly, this two billion dollars occurred uh, or was was allocated prior to. Uh, the much larger public and philanthropic arts infrastructure that we have today. Today, $2 billion is about 10% of, uh, of, of uh, philanthropy and local state federal funding to the arts in a given year. Um, this is even more salient in, 19, in 1935. So the idea is to use federal one as a policy experiment to study the impact of, uh, the impact of arts funding. Um, just a small note, um, you'll see this number of slides. I just want to let you know that the that the presentation is very front loaded and the estimates are loaded or and the causal estimates are, are loaded toward the back, which take a bit less time. So not to worry too much about that. So let me preview my results. I find very generally large, uh, large, large responses of artistic uh, of artistic professional shares in cities to funding, but that these fields and their uh, that that uh, these impacts and their persistence largely varies by the field by field of art. In particular, um, author uh, authors, theater and film industry professionals, certain kinds of visual artists. I demonstrate that uh, they respond very positively to funding, and that these effects last to the present day. To be very explicit, to be very explicit, that is the funding uh, the funding that uh, that was allocated by New Deal funding uh, that was allocated via the Works Progress Administration enacted lasting impacts that we see to the present day on local shares of these professionals. Um, these shares and, and 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 moreover, these shares are very are very large, increasing several increasing the shares of these uh, these professionals several fold. Um, other professions like music and other musicians and other types of visual artists saw um, more sort of very large short run impacts, but I'll show that the impacts weren't really sustained into the long run. Uh, the results, however, need to be grounded in co in context, and we can talk a lot about um, all the all the considerations and caveats. But we can think of the shock uh, as quite large, thinking that of, of, of about of a, of a federal expense of about fifty thousand U.S. dollars in present day per artist year. Uh, yeah, so quite large. Uh, I don't have too much time, but I'll uh, so I won't really go into talk about the related literature. But there's one that I like to highlight: uh, this Bowen and Kissida work. Um, this is what I view as as the uh, as one of the other most important estimate causal estimates of arts funding in their in their work. They study RCTs of arts education in Houston public schools, but. Um, for many reasons, there aren't too many causal estimates in uh, in this area. Um, that's all I'll say about literature. The results come with 
uh, several important policy implications, namely that public investment in the arts, even unsustained public investment in the arts, has scope to induce large increases in artistic employment shares in, uh, in the short run and even in the longer run for, uh, for some types of professionals. Um, Namely, writers, visual artists, theater and film professionals see large effects over time, um, suge suggesting that central, that central planners can enact, uh, can enact quite, con uh, quite considerable impact on, uh, on local artistic environments. Uh, and rationalizing these results, we, we also may rationalize the results, the variance and the variation in how, uh, how these different fields, how the effects of these different fields persist. We can uh, talk a little about more, whether they have more or less agglomerative potential. Um, some other important caveats, at least in the short run, the results don't, uh, I don't quite speak to uh, whether this result is, is driven by geographic sorting versus change in cohort occupation choice. Uh, this is more of a short run concern. Importantly, the results also don't inform optimality from like a normative perspective. This is an entire, or ideally, this is an entirely positivistic work, just demonstrating that this funding caused an increase in artist shares. Uh, there's also a concern, there's also an important consideration that I'd just like to emphasize with understanding the results uh, uh, the causal the causal impacts with respect to external validity, uh, the uh, arts environment, the philanthropic and policy environment in 1930 differs quite widely uh, from what we have today. So I'm going to talk about background and data. I'm going to show you the, the research design, and I'm probably only going to have time to walk through the causal uh, the causal results, which is through an instrumental uh, variables difference and difference design. So just to recap on federal project number one, uh, I think just think of it about two, uh, as about $2 billion and four separate programs. Importantly, I'm studying these four programs separately, the arts program, music program, theater, and writers. And I just repeat this because it's a very important de uh, detail just to be, or it's a very important, uh, uh, it's very important for the setting. Uh, and I'm going to be isolating causal identification using New Deal penetration instruments. Uh, I'll talk about that a bit more once we get to the uh, once we get to causal impacts. So I combine data from three main sources. The first source is for on federal one treatment. One of the big challenges in studying this is that it doesn't really exist online, uh, and uh, I had I had to go to the National Archives in uh in college park to digitize a lot of the employment roles that was a big challenge but that le I'll, I'll talk about the construction in a second but that left me with um employment shares for each of these four sub projects by locality cities um uh the next piece of data or the, the next big source of data comes from the u.s census bureau uh i estimate for each city i estimate artistic occupation shares um, from the full decadal censuses up until 1940. And after 1940, I used the census sample cuts, but um, the main outcome variables are OCK 1950 and end 1950. So throughout the whole work, the question is uh, OCK 1950 and end 1950 on the census correspond with the questions that are asking you, what is your occupation? What industry do you work in? And we can think of the dependent variable throughout this whole work as uh, the share of artistic professionals of a certain subfield in a certain city. Uh, There's a big problem with, uh, with historical econ, but we don't really have wages. We don't really know much about wages and earnings uh, from, uh, from uh, like a data complete perspective uh, prior to 1930 or 1930 and before, which is very unfortunate. There's some ways that some researchers get around that. Um, the last source of data is uh, the is the New Deal spending instruments. I take this from uh, Price Fishback's work, and I'll discuss this in a second. Um, just so you understand the data setting, my data is a panel of cities over time, and a city is included in my data if in the U.S. if in the U.S. Census they are present in both 1930 and 1940. So to be very clear, I'm studying uh, localities over decades. So let me show you an example of what the federal one data looked like at the National Archives. Uh, here is an employment role for the federal music program. Uh, the image is cropped, but uh, this is an employment role for July 1938. 
Uh, we can see this in San Francisco. We can see that in this month, San Francisco saw employment of 284, uh, 284 musicians. Uh, employment roles exist at the existed at the National Archives. Um, exist, continue to exist at the National Archives for all four of these projects. And the digitization work consisted of, uh, of taking photo photographs of these documents and digitizing them and processing them. And for each city, constructing average employment counts for each, uh, for each of the four subprograms. Uh, one, one important detail is that state and federal, the state and federal level uh, featured detailed expenditure tables. So I could see like wages and expenses for each state, but not really on the city. For this reason, I am, so if I want to study uh, expen, um, wages and expenses as an, in, as an independent variable, I impute this by projecting state wages onto local, uh, onto local employment counts. And this is how I generate all of my independent variable uh, variation, or short of short of the uh, of the instrumental variables part. Um, so think of it as cities employment counts. Uh, importantly, there's some other data that I'm not really using in this work right now. We can see in this example that there are that there's a sort of detailed breakdown on like the type of uh, on the type of activity. This work isn't really engaging with that yet. It's just I'm really thinking, and it this sort of ties into all of the challenges of of uh, of studying um, of studying the arts from a quantitative perspective. Um, the uh, caveman way that I'm doing it is just thinking of it as employment counts. Um, let me talk. So let me talk about uh, what federal project number one looked like on the ground level. Um, each of these four columns, this is the arts project, this is the music project, this is the theater project and the writers project. And I'm just, just and I've just laid out a few descriptive statistics on what uh, on what activity looked like for each of these projects. And I just want to highlight a few uh, a few things. Uh, just a few things. Importantly, the music program in the theater pro uh, in the theater project saw much uh, wider reach in terms of the distinct number of of, uh, of large cities in my sample that they uh, that they reached, where the arts and writers program only saw about uh, saw about twenty five each. Um, also, we can take a look at how big these programs were contextualized in the pre existing artist share. So, in, in the pre existing artist share uh, artist levels of cities. So. Uh, this row here is the median employment share among treated cities. So the arts program and the music pro uh, and the music program, uh, they typically employed numbers of people that uh, are uh, uh, an amount of people that was about equal to about between 15 and 20 percent of the pre-existing uh, number of number of artists, which in of itself, to be very clear, is large. Uh, but for the theater and writers and the writers project, the employment the employment amount was even larger. Uh, these programs typically employed we see on median here, employed uh, theater practitioners and writers at numbers equal to or greater than the previous uh, than 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 the pre existing uh, artist population for these respective fields. So we can really think of these as very large, uh, really large salient instances of spending. So now I'm going to be talking about identification. Uh, primary threat to identification here is that, as with most pro as with most programs, there isn't really sufficient randomization. The main threat that I'm thinking about here is that the localities with the greatest propensity for artistic growth are those that select into program activity, um, namely because federal one funding, along with a lot of Works Progress Administration funding, was allocated ultimately via application. One way that we could think about this, if arts activity is path dependent and federal one funds um, are allocated just effectively to the states or to the localities with the, with, with the most thriving art scenes, running OLS on, running OLS on uh, in this design would really pick up a treatment effect just for cities having thriving art scenes in, uh, in 1930. So that's the main identification threat in this setting. And we can take we can take a look at some descriptives to uh, I guess val I guess validate some of these concerns. So right here, I've just plotted um, mean difference mean differences in cities that received federal any federal project number one funding as a binary variable versus those that didn't. And we can see that on many counts there are some important differences. The 
cities that received funding were generally larger in 1930, continue to be larger today, um, saw much higher, uh, much higher levels of artists and musicians per capita, uh, as a point estimate, higher, uh, higher, uh, higher share of actors and writers, albeit actors is not, is not significant, but we can, but perhaps this can validate some of those concerns that, um, validate some of those concerns and provide motivation for the instrumental variables uh, design. So the general research design proceeds as follows. It's uh, my preferred specification among, among other specifications that I estimate uh, is a difference in difference design that uses city level fixed effects. So the idea is, is econometrically looking at, looking at cities and studying, and studying how, uh, how these artist shares evolve in those cities over time around uh, around instances of funding. Um, the econometric specification is equivalent to just asking the question, how does the population share of artists in field L evolve over uh, over decades in response to federal one funding to subprogram L? This is an important and so a really important detail um, or um, an important detail for just um, comfortability with the design is that I'm pairing up visual arts professions with uh with the arts program music uh music music professions with the music program theater uh and theater professionals theater and film industry professionals with the theater program and writing and related fields with the uh with the writing program uh there are other econometric considerations here the one that i'm the one that i'll highlight one of these um central to this design um, uh, central to this design is that spending in one discipline doesn't affect other disciplines. The way that I've, the way that I'm, uh, that I'm estimating my reduced forms is, as I said, um, in a pair, in, uh, in a pairwise fashion. So for example, um, I, um, the econometric specification, uh, precludes theater activity from funding, uh, from, from, from affecting the musician shares over time. Um, uh which 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 could rep which could represent a potential uh critique of this design but uh yeah uh and here's the reduced form i also estimate uh correlated random effects models but as i mentioned my preferred specification is going to include city level fixed effects um let me talk about the instrumental variables design so to address all the so to the uh to address the endogeneity concerns i'm using local new deal uh activity instruments the way that I think about this is that I take a locality, uh, I take a locality, and I take a look at all of the New Deal spending that occurred in that locality, and then I subtract off the federal one spending. Uh, that's this is effectively a New Deal spending leave out. The concept behind this instrument is that uh, is is to leverage the funding that was induced by New Deal network spending, either because applications were a local knowledge good, uh, application into Works Progress Administration programs were a local knowledge good, or due to the existence of preferential funding networks. But the intuition behind the instrument is that I take this uh, New Deal spending leave out, and uh, for uh, for lo for localities. Uh, Localities that receive that re that receive funding that is uh, localities that re that re that receive non arts funding from the New Deal are more likely to receive New Deal uh, New Deal arts funding uh, in a manner that's orthogonal to their pre existing arts shares. In this framework, I'll be picking up local average treatment effects for uh, specifically average treatment effects for cities that are induced into federal one treatment through New Deal spending. Just to ground this into like a late framework. Um, let me provide, let me, let's get into the IV results and or actually let me uh, provide like a little validation here. One concern, uh, one concern about this, about, about the IV design uh, is, um, is that it, that it respects exclusion. Uh, I just want to just talk about this, uh, just talk about this for a second. Um, one concern might be that uh, New Deal, that New Deal funding to non-arts programs would affect economic outcomes in localities that received, uh, in, in localities that, that received that, that funding, influencing economic outcomes, uh, would then influence uh, artistic location. Then this, would, then this would constitute a violation of exclusion. Um, as I mentioned, we don't we don't really have wages and and uh, and income data or earnings data prior to 1940, which makes it really hard. But there are uh, indices. There are indices that exist on uh, on 
in uh, as, as as census variables for understanding um, for for su for suggesting some of these changes in socioeconomic status on uh, on average in cities and projecting uh, and and uh, projecting these indicators like occupation score, occupation social economic status, earnings, prestige onto the instrument, we can see we can see that this wasn't really the case. We have slightly significant uh, we have slightly significant correlations in uh, in uh, in the short in the short run, but that don't really exist in but that don't really exist in the long run. And I just present this just to validate the instrument a little bit. Um, I'll also show that the New Deal spending that the New Deal spending instrument doesn't really demonstrate the same correlation with pre-existing artist shares as did the raw treatment, and save for uh, save for visual artists, uh, uh, save yeah, save for visual artists. The last thing uh, I'll just show the first show the first stage here. I've plotted this is just a bin scatter of uh, employment uh, of federal one employment on the. Uh, on the y-axis and my instrument on the x-axis, and uh, it the instrument dem demonstrates considerable power in the first stage, which is reassuring. So now I'm going to get into instrumental variable uh, results. The first design as the the first of us design pairs up the federal uh, writers project with writers. Um, here I've I've plotted the difference in difference coefficients uh, over uh, over decades and. The first central result is that writers uh, that the cities that received uh, that received writing funding demonstrate a very large response in the short run, and importantly, a response that persists over time. Oh, actually, I should mention. So, um, uh, all the deep in these specifications, all the independent variables are just binary indicators for whether cities uh, receive funding. So, particularly, this is in the IV in the IV design, but the binary variable is just whether a city received funding for uh, for a certain program. Anyways, the writers demonstrated a very large uh, a very large increase uh, increase in their shares in the short run and the long run um, compared to their 1930s baselines. Uh, compared to a compared to a 1930 baseline, uh, the program the program induced a causal a causal increase in the share of the population that identify as writers uh, on the magnitude of several fold. Uh, as a validation, we can also look at individuals that are employed in the publishing industry, in, in the publishing and writing industry. Um, this is a, so there's a different uh, there's a different dependent variable, and we can see increases of a similar magnitude uh, that are similarly persistent, but but importantly, uh, they they tend to attenuate a little bit over time. Uh, the main the main result here is uh, is that. Uh, is that the writer's response? That the writer's response to the writer's response to funding is both large and persistent, which isn't necessarily the case for other fields. So let me take a look at visual arts. So here, the dependent variable are individuals that identify as general visual artists, and we can observe, I guess, ostensibly a little light pre-trend uh, for the for the pre-period. But um, I mean, this if anything, this, if anything, this might validate. Uh, uh, I guess our understanding that, that this design is doing anything. The visual for the visual artists, uh, we see a very large increase in their shares in the short run. But in fact, that this result isn't sustained at all, even a single decade after, even a single decade after funding has been um, has been stopped. Uh, this is a similar case for other art uh, for other visual arts fields like painters. But there are, but importantly, there are fields. Uh, um, there are fields that uh, have slightly stronger results. Um, designers, um, these are individ individuals, individuals identifying as designers as their primary occupation. Um, if anything, I think the, 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 the results appear less, uh, quite less null than uh, for, uh, than for um, general visual artists and for uh and for and for painters but still um the long run the long run persistence is is some is somewhat questionable certainly the increase in the in the short uh, in in the short run um but the response but this response is a bit stronger for photographers looking at uh now substituting photog uh, photographers as the as the dependent variable um the design demonstrates a large increase in the short run um here once again several fold about two about a 200% uh a 200 a 200% um increase in the share uh one thing on interpretation it can be a little um i guess the i guess the 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 percent 
impact interpretation can be a little bit confusing because as a baseline, the percent of individuals that identifies these uh, occup uh, with these professions as their main occupation is quite low. Um, but this would correspond with an increase from like three in 10,000 to eight in 10,000. Anyways, that this result, uh, that the result for photographers persists uh, substantially over time. Um, although we can see attenuates a little bit. Um, uh, you know, I realized one thing I, I, that was on the slides, but I didn't, but I didn't mention. Uh, 19, 19, you'll see that 1970 is excluded for all of these designs. Um, uh, that's just because uh, the U.S. Census counts don't uh, don't lend don't lend for disaggregation by cities in 1970. Uh, that's something that I'll be able to address though in in uh, in like 20 years, maybe 30 years, uh, once the full census is released. Um, sorry to continue. Let's take taking a look at music uh, music programs uh, or the music music professionals. Um, the result is the result may be a little bit harder to see when it's broken out uh oh, like in the in the long run by this but music in general is an, uh, at least according to at least according to these estimates i observe a a, an, a significant short run impact that similar to some of the visual artists doesn't really uh doesn't really persist into the long run and um we see in in fact uh toward the end of the century we see like super uh, large error bars. Uh, it's worth mentioning that these, uh, that the standard errors here are all clustered on the city level. Uh, as a validation, we can take a look at piano tuners. Um, for, piano, for piano tuners, there's, a, there's a, a marginally significant impact in the short run, but similar to musicians, nothing really, uh, nothing really persisting into the long run. The last group that I'll show you are, um, uh, are theater are theater and film industry professionals the results for the theater and film industry are uh, are all, are also interesting um i docu i document a positive uh, a positive point estimate that's not uh that's not statistically significant in the short run but that increases in significance uh over time but this isn't the case for all of for all of the uh for for all types of theater and film industry practitioners. We can take a look at actors. Actors was uh, was an explicit object of interest in, oh, oh no, I'm zoomed out. Was our uh, actors uh, is a is a specific um, OCK 1950 category in of itself. Um, I'm a little bit more hesitant to conduct inference on this exact field. Um, given the given the pretrends, but if anything, actors exhibited a large decrease uh, following, uh, following the funding. The last one I'll show you are, uh, are dancers. Uh, from what I, from what I see in this design, I see a similar, uh, a sim I can, I can see a similar story to some of the visual artists field, to some of, to some of the visual artists fields with, uh, a significant increase in the short run that doesn't really persist into the long run. So, uh, here are the point here here are the point estimates, but uh, I see it's past the thirty right now. So actually, we can we can go over the point estimates if if it's interesting. Um, but I'll but I can conclude on that note if uh, if not, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let me let me conclude on that note for now. We can we can go back to point estimates otherwise, um, or after um, this pro uh, this program evaluation uses New Deal spending instruments to produce causal to, to produce estimates of the causal impacts of this stylized instance of arts funding on the uh, on the share of artistic professionals and, and studies how that share evolves in the short run and whether that and whether that effect persists into the long run. Uh, I find that writing as well as some visual arts and theater film industry professionals demonstrate uh, demonstrate quite large responses. Um, or, ra or rather, most of the fields demonstrate demonstrate very large responses in the in, in the short run, but rather that only some of the fields uh, demonstrate persistence of uh, of these impacts into the long run. Um, it, and and importantly, we can understand we can understand this uh, the the fund the the stylized funding instance as a, as an unsustained instance of funding. So this answers the question. Uh, to what extent? Uh, to what extent can central planners influence their local artistic environments through even un through through uh, through even unsustained instances of funding to the arts? And the answer is potentially quite considerably, and more moreover, quite considerably into the long run. 
Um, I'll just ground the results, uh, recall just a few, a few caveats. I haven't really spoken to the source of occupational movement. In the short run, there's this, there's a concern about uh, geographic, uh, geographic mobility versus uh, cohort occupation choice, which may, there's, there's, uh, there's a note on sattva about that, but this is a less of a concern in the long run. Um, there's also the open question of why, uh, of, of, of why do, of why do some of the, um, fields demonstrate less persistence or more persistence over time. I have a model environment that that speaks to that, um, but um, we can discuss that. Uh, we can just uh, we can possibly discuss that. The last um, consideration that I just like to emphasize is the role of of the role of external validity. And just to emphasize that the policy environments are very different from back then and today. Uh, I'll conclude on that note. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'd be very happy to discuss this uh, with anybody. Thank you, Jacob. Um, that was fascinating. And thank you for that presentation. I think a lot of us are just so interested, not only in this topic, but honestly, um, the way you go about testing the effect of these programs and honestly, the, the measures you use and obviously the mechanisms. I think that's what was sort of um, pulling at me throughout your entire presentation is I'm so interested in these mechanisms um, beyond kind of what you're testing. And I know it's tough to speak to that. So for example, um, things like um, entry into artistic occupations as opposed to occupational persistence, right? So how many of these are new people entering into the labor force as opposed to, um, you know, people who are able to then persist. Um, I mean, there's just so many questions. I don't want to take over the floor. I know we have a lot of others. So I'm going to actually just open it up if somebody wants to um, uh, unmute themselves and ask. Michael, go. Oh, okay. Go, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll start. Thank you, Jacob. That's that's super interesting. And, uh, and I think uh, since there's been so much talk about uh, New Deal arts programs in the past year or two, um, it is just uh, really fantastic to have somebody really digging into the data and saying, well, what do these programs actually do? Uh, I think this is really necessary. Um, the, the thing that was running through my mind, uh, I, I guess, uh, throughout, and, and, and maybe you deal with this uh, sort of elsewhere in the work, is about the demand side for the arts. And that there are, you know, in any city, um, to some, you know, to, uh, to a really big degree, the uh, number of people working in a field is completely dependent on demand. So piano tuners, which you raised, for example, we can, we can offer a subsidy to piano tuners if we want, but there's still only a certain number of pianos in a town that need tuned. Uh, that's not gonna change with the number of piano tuners because any household deciding to buy a piano or not is not asking, well, you know, what's the price of piano tuning around here? They're just gonna do it or not. And so you're not really gonna get variation. And for things like musicians and dancers, it really does, uh, along with piano tuners, really does depend on, is there a local audience for this kind of stuff? Writers and painters, it seems much less so. So Iowa City has lots of writers, but it's not because Iowa City has, you know, just a really tremendous amount of novel readers. It's just that this is an agglomeration of writers who benefit from that agglomeration, but it's not because that's where they're gonna make all their sales. And so I wonder how this comes into your work in terms of those differences, I think important differences between artistic fields, if that yeah, makes any sense. Totally. And I think that's a really important question. Um, on that note, one of the one of the important things to ground the the causal estimates uh, within is that is that oh, particularly for particularly for the inference into the into the longer run, the results reflect changes in both supply and demand, as uh, as Michael suggests. One of the things that I've been discussing to speak very closely to to the point uh, to to your point is that I think there's a role of institutionalization. I think there's a role of institutionalization in the in in the long run effect. So you point out how like your priors might indicate, or you you. You mentioned how your priors might suggest that, like, you would that, that you would think that musicians and certain kinds of uh, or certain kinds of musicians would demonstrate a longer run impact due to uh, due to demand. But it may be the case it may be the case that there's more in, that there's um, uh, more institutional demand from for 
writers and visual artists that can uh, that can absorb increased uh, that can absorb increased supply in and and also influence and also influence uh, subsequent demand in the model framework I which I had which I haven't really gone over gone over here I experimented a bit with path dependent demand uh, uh, demand and supply and there's this role of institutionalization that I just uh, that 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 I just that I just talked about like maybe there are like there are literally com like com uh, companies not only not only just uh, not only people that are leisure consumers of uh, of arts companies require writers and uh, and to another extent companies require uh, uh, visual uh, visual artists so maybe there's this institutional role um, but uh, but aside from that the model framework that I haven't gone over here is uh, suggests a sort of big push suggests a sort of big push mechanism. Whereas uh, we could think we could think of uh, there being some two like uh, in the most in the simple in the simplest way we could think of there being like two stable equilibria and an unstable and, a, and an unstable equilibrium for um, like the low for the share of artists and an investment would need to surpass like an unstable equilibrium amount would need to constitute a large enough investment in order to push a locality to one of these new equilibria. Um, I, I think I think the question is is very is very complicated and very hard to answer, but obviously very important. Um, I'd love to speak to it a bit more sharply. Um, uh, I hope I can address. I hope that addresses like a little bit of it. Neil. Yeah, I guess I have a, a measurement question <clears throat> for you. My understanding is that some of these. <clears throat> uh, programs were traveling programs. The theater programs, for example, went from city to city, uh, et cetera. And so my question would be, and in those city, and probably the dance programs and probably some of these music programs where they had to be required by union rules, et cetera, they were required to hire local workers. Where did those local workers count? Did they count in the location where that program was initiated? Did they count as employees in the program where <clears throat> where they were you know where they were hired? I yeah. Mean, so so how do you deal with that when you have these travel? When I believe you have these traveling programs. No, that, that that's that's a good point. And uh, there's a whole there's a I think it's a really fascinating uh, program just from like a history just from like a, a historical perspective. Um, from what I from what I understand. The archival data reflects local local employment uh, local employment levels. What Neil points out was more was most prominent for the theater program, but also right. existed uh, for but also existed to uh, a smaller extent for the music to the music program. Um, in one in one res in one respect, um, the the majority of the majority activity wasn't uh, wa wasn't this traveling activity, but the but my main but my main response to that would be the that that the archival that the archival data reflects the local employment what about funding is that i can't remember did you deal with were you concerned about funding so funding funding is funding is a bit is a bit more complicated okay. because these projects on the sub so individual projects like um like the, the like the theater project, they operated as you as units that were within that were within the state. Um, so, like if I want, I, I'm in New Deal time. I'm imagining that I'm I'm, I'm imagining that I want to I want to make a project, and I just apply and and I make an application. Presumably, I have some other like colleagues that I'm that I'm with, and I make an application, and I get the funding, and I organize, um, and uh, and. All the funding is, and all the funding is channeled through my sub project. So, um, very sharply, I can't. Re I, I'm. I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not really in a position to study funding on an incredibly granular level. Right. The best way that I approach funding, I have this in the paper, is by projecting wages uh, that are set on the state level and projecting it onto local employment counts. So, like, if I know that, like, the 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 that the wage for like a musician in California was like ninety dollars a month. I uh, can project that onto San Francisco's um, uh, um, uh, musician employment for July. One last, but but, but they're also but they're also administ but they're also administrative expenses uh, that 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 really doesn't capture. Mm 
One quick question. <clears throat> How about the political environment? I mean, one of the big issues with a theater project, of course, is that many of those people who participated were brought up in front of HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee yeah. at that time. And they closed down the program, at least in New York. I'm not sure how much further they closed it down. Does Do you feel that that might make a, have made a difference in any fashion? In yeah. Like just just to emphasize, there are some really fat. This I think this is a really fascinating project. Um, the theater the theater program was shut down prematurely in June of in in uh, I think it was June or ordered shut down in June of nineteen thirty nine and winded down winded down over the next year. Um, particularly for this result for result for actors, I suspect there was potential conflict, but I suspect there was yes this role for conflict. I suspect that there was all that there was also. Um, heavy conflict with unions there's an anthology of the theater programs by um actually the former director the director of the music pro the the or i said music i meant theater there's an anthology of the theater pro, of the theater program by hallie flanagan who was the director of the theater program and in the anthology she discusses exactly this the con the political conflict and the conflict with uh with local actors unions um so for the, I, I should say for the, I should say for the most part, all of the programs, not, not only the theater, in, in spite of the fact that only the theater program was legally mandated to be shut down in 1939, uh, all of the programs started winding down significantly after 1939, which is why I, which is why um, conveniently I can, I can uh, confine my time frame to 1935 to 1939. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug. Yeah. Yeah, Jacob, thank you. This is great stuff. Um, I am really excited to see someone doing such sort of rigorous work on this, especially given that way where current conversations are. And then I hope we have time to come back to that uh, sort of big picture questions in a, in a couple minutes. But I, I wanted to ask you uh, two more technical and rather mundane questions. <clears throat> the first one involves <clears throat> uh, actually kind of harkens back to Michael's point about the man side on this. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about your instrumental variable picking up essentially uh, proxying for something other than uh, actually getting federal one funding, but generally picking up more New Deal uh, funding and that that might be supporting things, uh, favorable environments for some of this. The second uh, question is about this sort of agglomeration or nonlinearity is aspects of what you're trying to estimate in part because maybe a one percentage point change in employment share uh, might be different in a low employment, a, a low density cluster versus a high density cluster. But I'm also really curious if you were able to do anything to look at the effects of the treatment in places that were sort of low density in terms of art share uh, versus places that were higher density. And did this have any kind of heterogeneous effects that you were able to detect? I'll speak to the second point first. I think the second point is really good, and I haven't and I and I and I haven't uh, studied this margin of heterogeneity. But uh, at least for the purpose of the paper, I think I, uh, I I I think it's definitely a good idea. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I, all all I can say is that I haven't done that, and I agree that I that I think that's a really good idea. The first uh, the first point. Uh, just to recap for everybody, it was asking whether uh, Doug was asking whether the New Deal, uh, the New Deal funding instrument, might be proxying for uh, favorable uh, favorable conditions that uh, for for um, uh, that that might that might give rise that might give rise to um, to propagation of to propagation of artists. I think the main response to that would that would be a lot of a. From what from what I under, from what I understand, most of these New Deal grants and WPA grants were uh, that were given out by volume uh, by by um, by spend by spending volume. Most of these were quasi agricultural or home loans or um, or uh, ho home loans or like or um, infrastructure development projects like electrification projects. Um, I can take a look. I can take a look uh, at the exact types of projects that were that were that were funded. I do feel a little bit. I do feel somewhat validated that that isn't the case. Um, there's a 
there's a liter there's a literature review from uh, from Price Fishback. He uh, he does all he does a ton of work on the, on the New Deal, and in his literature review, he looks at all of the not I mean all uh, a great number of the IV designs uh, in New Deal environments, and a lot of and 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 a lot of the um, a lot a, a, I shouldn't I don't want to say that they they use this, they use the instrument, but a lot of the um, program a lot of the program activity focuses on like electrification programs um local construction projects um there's agriculture there's agricultural work also um i wonder if i'm speaking sharply enough to the point that you're raising um, no, I maybe it's something that we can maybe it's something that we could discuss uh that we could discuss after i think it's i think it's important sure king feng um I have a probably a silly question because I know no, no. nothing about the funding thing, but I'm wondering how this funding programs, how their funding criteria have changed from historical criteria to the current. Like what their funding priority have changed? I don't know. I mean, do they do they explicitly list anything about this historical funding or not? Yeah, yeah, this is this is a great point too. To be honest, my ideal design, well, well, there are a lot of ideal designs, but one other, I think an idea, and I think a design that would be preferable to this. I mentioned at the very beginning that that funding was allotted via application. I would love to see these applications because that because that because that might lend for uh in some way or in, in some way or another, possibly an R possibly an RD design looking at places that received like more marginal applications and compare along that margin. One problem uh, one problem is that uh, these applications don't exist uh, don't exist anymore um, which is which is a big problem. There is substantial discussion over how uh, over how applications over how applications were granted, and my understanding and uh, and my under, and my understanding is that applications on the sub on the sub state level were vetted both by were, were vetted significantly by both state and federal boards, and there were significant rejections that did uh, that did take place to applications. Mm -hmm. um, okay. As for now, as for the present day. You know, to be honest, it's I I know uh, I know much less about much less about uh like the granular arts funding environment today. I know that we have the we have the NEA, which is which has about a five billion. Uh, I think it's like a no, like a one billion dollar budget. I think, um, and they do and they do grants, but most of but most arts funding, uh, I I, I think at least arts education funding occurs on the state and local level. Actually, let me let me let me punt and say I actually don't know much about how the NEA prioritizes grants, so mm -hmm. I have to punt on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I ask this question because I've been thinking. Yes, based on I know nothing about funding, our funding, is it a path dependence of funding mechanism, or is it a path dependence of the art industry themselves? If, yeah. If current funding, they are highly impacted by the like political environment, the industrial structure, the creative class, you know, a lot of this talks. So how the historical funding impact the local, this socioeconomic, those things has an impact on current funding. So I, I, I'm just thinking it, it, is, it could be the impact of the historical funding, but you were talking about there's a pocket dependence of funding mechanisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, sh yeah. I should have been more clear. I should have been more clear about this. To be so, to be very clear, uh, your point is totally correct. And the oh, let me let me let me just let me just give a specific example by scrolling back to the like the the author's example. Um, there is a um, there is an there is an identification concern which is very closely related to what you're to what you're talking about with the path of, with the role of path dependence in the in the in the long run there's an ortho, there's an orthogonality condition that probably isn't satisfied that like you know if if um uh you know the whole the whole con the whole concern was that like uh our that was that we don't want to just um uh, and we're just we don't want to study funding in uh, in like a correlative uh, in a correlative perspective, looking at just like treatment on the treated. But 
in these, but in the, but in these long, but in these long run, uh, in these, in these longer run impacts are probably not, uh, are probably not produced in a manner that's orthogonal to future instances of funding. So that's like an important, I think, I think there's a really important consideration for how to interpret the long, the longer run impacts. If we believe that there's, if we believe that there's path dependence in, in this setting, this impact rate, we could think of this impact, like this large initial impact, um, uh, Indu induce induces a significant change in the local environment and future and uh, and future interventions, be the future policy interventions or even just uh, development of like de development subsequent uh, evolution of the environment is not orthogonal to to this to this uh, policy impact. That's a very I think that's a, like a, a very important detail to ground the results in. Um, Jacob, I wanted to just go back to this institutionalization effect that we were talking about earlier, because it keeps yeah. on, um, especially in terms of your, your results, it keeps on really um, being a kind of a major thing that's sticking out for me. Because if you take a look at where you found the sustained long run impacts, a lot of these sustained long run impacts are in disciplines that are much more um, uh, sort of centralized in the nonprofit sector. Right, so music, design, those types of professions are much more in the for-profit sphere. Writing, um, not so much writing, but I would say theater for sure. Right, some visual arts is much more nonprofit. And if you think about just like the the development of the nonprofit sector post 1940s to post 1950s was like a huge era for just building the nonprofit sector in in the U.S. And I'm just wondering, like how to go about um, parsing that out a bit in your, in, in how you identify the, the, the effect, like thinking about, I mean, one thing you do already, which is quite nice is looking at shares based on occupation and industry. So I do think like the shares in industry provide us with a little bit of information on institutionalization of these professions um, as opposed to shares in occupation. But I wonder if you could even, start to get at that a bit more by perhaps looking at um, kind of, um, you know, I don't know if you can get these data historically, but like firms in the arts, firm counts for these cities, for example, um, obviously county business patterns, I assume doesn't go back that far, but like something that basically gets at like what the development of the organizational sector for these particular disciplines look like. And then somewhat relatedly, I was really like, I like your assumption of the direct impact from the actual specific type of federal policy program to the, to the, like the sub program assumption that you have, which is just looking at the direct impact between, right, the theater program to actors, et cetera, et cetera. But I also then wonder sort of if you start to, could start to get at more sort of inducement type effects of whether or not just arts funding did, did something to the arts environment overall. Because a lot of the arguments that are coming out right now is just that like more arts are good, right? And I know that your paper doesn't say that and I, and I super appreciate that because I think it's a logic in the way that we think about art. It, it's a flaw in logic of how we think about arts funding. More arts is not necessarily good and more arts funding is not always good too. But I also just wonder like, is there something to be said for if you fund the arts, um, will you also just, in any area, will you also see an expansion of the arts sector as a result, but, and, and trying to get at that? I think those are some really important points that you bring up. Um, as for the first point, the first thing that I, the first thing that I think about was something that I explored a bit more at earlier stages of this work. Um, there is publicly available data on on uh, on nonprofit activity. We can see the universe of 990s and 990 PFs. Um, I think this extends pretty far back. I think one way to study that, or one one way to uh, to study your question, would be making use of uh, of of that data of that data. Um, they're like firm or firm year, or I guess it's not proper to call them a firm if they're nonprofits, EIN year returns. Um, I'm not sure how, how far back they go though. Um, I also think of treasury data, but I, this is, this is something that, that, I, that I've thought a bit about. And this also ties in with, with your second point. 
one of uh, I, I really I, I think there's a nice a nice interpretation and secularity that comes with the in, that comes with the dependent variable. But I was in one respect, I was almost sort of cornered into it because of the historical limitations. Um, as I mentioned, there are no like way we, we have the wage limit wage data earnings data are incredibly limited um, uh, prior to 1940. The biggest limiting factor is is comprehensive data for from from a historical perspective. Yeah, which is I'd why love, I'd, yeah, I'd love doing, to discuss more. Yeah, yeah, we should connect offline, which is why what you're doing honestly is just um, so fascinating in and of itself because you you actually got these data from the archives, which you know I commend you. But 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 even but even the deep but even the deep, dependent variation like uh, from real from. What I from what I understand, like I, we really we really don't have a great picture. I I could I could not perform this reduced form estimation on individual economic outcomes, or I, I guess other than something like occupation uh, occupation uh, status or something. Well, we have to end, but fascinating work, Jacob. We thank you so much for coming. Um, we are, it was just lovely. So we'll give a round of applause in this. Thank, and thank you so much for your excellent questions and, and feedback. Thank you. That was great, so Jacob. everybody, thank thanks for coming and um, for participating. We have a little bit of a break until our next speaker, until December, um, Susan Oman. But everybody, have a happy Thanksgiving, a uh, happy November, and we'll see you in December. And Jacob, absolutely, let's all connect offline because I know there's a lot more discussion to be Yes, yeah, spe uh, speaking, uh, I, I know you have to leave, but uh, 